It's Radio Free 501C, the podcast of Rogue Tulips Consulting. I'm your host, Cecilia Sapp, and we're so excited to be back for Season 6 and continue bringing you outstanding ideas and thought leaders and different ways of thinking. So don't forget to subscribe because you're not going to want to miss any of it. This week, I'm joined by first-time guest, Johanna Snyder. She's the CEO of Blue Cypress, and she's here to talk about AI advice for associations, and she's got a lot of good stuff. It's February 12th, 2024. Welcome to episode 228. Hey, everybody, it's Monday, February 12th, and that means it's time for another episode of Radio Free 501C, brought to you by Rogue Tulips Consulting. I'm your host, Cecilia Sepp. I am the principal and founder of Rogue Tulips, and I want to thank everyone for joining us and to our global audience. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be. So we're already into February. It's the second month of the first quarter. And what is everybody talking about in the nonprofit world, especially membership associations? Artificial intelligence and how it can help us. But we do need to think it through. And that's why I'm so excited that first time guest on my podcast, Johanna Snyder of Blue Cypress is here and she's going to share her advice for associations on using AI. But Johanna, before we jump into our conversation, welcome. Would you like to say hello to the audience and tell us a little about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Cecilia. Um, So my name is Johanna Snyder, uh, Johanna Casper Snyder. Um, I am the CEO of Blue Cypress. I have been in the association industry now for um, I guess going on about 15 years. Um, at Blue Cypress, I'm responsible for overall operations and growth of our company, and that includes our family of companies underneath it, um, and really defining the strategic direction in close collaboration with our with our chairman, Amith Nagarajan. Uh, but before that, I have worked mostly with uh, different AMS vendors, um, started with Aptify actually right out of grad school. Uh, doing implementations and project management, uh, moved over into sales, and then eventually found my way to community brands where I held a number of sales leadership positions there. So, but Blue Cypress specifically, to give you a little bit of background on that, uh, we are a growth incubator and accelerator, which sometimes I say that in the association space and people kind of scratch their heads like, what is that? (laughs) (laughs) And um, what it is, is that we we help launch new uh, companies and products and in some instances, although a little bit more rarely, we also help grow earlier stage existing companies. But for the most part, uh, we help launch new companies. So we work a lot with entrepreneurs in the space that are specifically serving social sector and associations. Uh, so we're there to kind of help provide a launch pad for them for these products and ideas uh, that they come up with. And we've got 13 companies underneath the Blue Cypress umbrella. Um, that are kind of our core companies. We have another nine that are kind of adjacent to Blue Cypress and in our, what we call our extended family network. Um, but those 13 companies are all dedicated specifically to associations in the social sector. And I would say our kind of bread and butter and where we sort of differentiate is that we, we're just, we're hyper-focused on kind of cutting edge technology. We've been focused on AI specifically and how to leverage that not only internally with our companies, but in the products and services that we're producing for a long time. I mean, some of the companies that we have that are really AI centric have been around for for several years. We kind of see ourselves as a community and a launch pad um, for people that really want to innovate and create really kind of impactful and novel products and services for the space. That is a lot going on at Blue Cypress. I love it. Uh, It's interesting though. I think Blue Cypress, before we dive into what we're supposed to be talking about, I think it's really interesting. Blue Cypress has done an excellent job maintaining those separate identities for the different companies, because like you and I were talking about before uh, we started the episode, I didn't even realize some of these companies were under the Blue Cypress umbrella. So kudos to that, because I think it'd be very easy to overshadow everybody. I was also reading uh, Blue Cypress is committed to conscious capitalism which is a movement to not just think about making money and serving the stockholders or shareholders, but also just making sure that we're making society a better place. And I think that's something a lot of us in the nonprofit world, we know we could do it, but I don't think we realize just how huge an impact we could have if we all acted together. And 
uh, when Elizabeth Engel and Shelley Alcorn were on the show uh, to talk a couple weeks, well, actually it was last month, to talk about their white paper on climate change. That is a big part of their findings is that what if all the nonprofits and associations within the nonprofit world got together and did something for climate change? Because we, we all have that little piece of the world that we're working in. And what if we made that place a better place? And that's kind of what I say to people as my philosophy, where your two feet are is the place where you can make things better. And if everybody did that, wow, you know, it's like the rising tide lifts all shit. So it's, it's a great philosophy, but that's a probably a topic for another episode, because I do want to talk about artificial intelligence, because I was kind of laughing at myself when I went to uh, hit record for this episode and it said AI assistant. And I said, no. And then I start laughing at myself because <laughs> it was like, we're talking about AI. So why didn't I try it? But I, I think uh, it's interesting, though, if you could tell us a little bit, Johan, about your own experience with AI, like when did you start working with it? What have you learned? And then how can that advice help association? Yeah, so I, I would say that I'm I'm kind of, I kind of came to it from where I think the average person comes to AI. I mean, I didn't know a lot about it, especially if you go back to um, like 2022 when I first joined Blue Cypress, came over from Community Brands. I didn't have a ton of exposure to AI, um, and I went to the Digital Now conference in 2022, and that was that was November of 2022, and if, you know, I'm sure a lot of people that listen to the podcast are familiar with that conference, but it, it tends to focus on really cutting edge technology. It, it tries to bring in a lot of speakers from sort of outside the association space at, at the 2022 conference, like, you know, other digital now conferences that had a lot of Silicon Valley speakers that were talking about these sort of large macro AI trends and you know, my exposure to it was limited enough that I was kind of sitting there with my eyes wide that whole time. Um, and then one of the days also was on, on Web3, which also was kind of blowing my mind. Um, but I remember coming away from that conference and thinking, wow, there's so much just immediate tactical stuff that you should be able to do with AI. And then flip forward three weeks and ChatGPT, you know, GPT-3.5 3 was released right, like right at the end of November. So for me, it was just kind of really good timing because my mind was already sort of prepped from coming out of this conference um, with, you know, ideas and use cases. And so when that came out, I just immediately, you know, signed up for, for a trial account. And, and I would say generally just uh, at Blue Cypress, we just tend to, because we work with a lot of startups, we just tend to be very agile and kind of open to experimentation. Um, and I recognize that we also because of our structure, we're kind of, we're kind of able to do that, right? I mean, some organizations that are a little bit more mature and, and, you know, operate in a different way that can be harder to implement right out of the gate. Um, but I just started experimenting with it um, because I've kind of always come from this mindset of just, you know, how can I increase my output? How can I move quickly? Um, I've always kind of come from a place of, of doing work um, in whatever job that I had of, you know, how can I leverage existing templates, existing like books, best practices, so I don't have to start from scratch? How can I do more with less? Um, so, so that kind of bootstrap mindset. So I feel like I was already sort of, even though I wasn't experimenting with AI yet, and I didn't know much more about it than the average person, I felt kind of already primed to be able to sort of experiment with it. Um, so in, in that way, it was actually really easy to just quickly adopt it into my work stream. So that, that's my personal experience. Blue Cypress actually is, is different from an organizational perspective. We have ties to AI going way back. I mean, um, Rasa, which is one of the companies in our family, is an, is an AI newsletter. Um, and that's been around now for, for seven years. So they're kind of like the OG of, <laughs> of AI products in this space. And, and Amit is someone just as a technologist and as a, you know, as a, you know, he's a developer, you know, at heart too. Um, he's always you know, been kind of learning about it and sharing that knowledge. Um, so, so Blue Cypress, I would say, was even in a, in a better position than I was, you know, someone coming from more of a business mindset to take advantage of it. But I was at least just open to it and, and ready to experiment with it when it came along. Oh, well, that definitely makes a difference having that experimentation mindset, because uh, 
I know a lot of associations, especially uh, within the nonprofit world, do not like to take risks. They don't want to try something new because what if it doesn't work? And that's why we get stuck in that. That's the way we've always done it mindset, which ends up getting us stuck in a rut. And I think AI has really done a lot to shake a lot of us out of our ruts and think differently about how we work and how we do things. Uh, I've said many times, like in podcast conversations with others, and in my blog post, uh, not a real fan of generative AI at this time. I love it as a research tool. I think it's awesome. And I do know a lot of people use it as a tool within their association to do all those things you just said, save time, make your your work more effective as, as opposed to efficient. So what were some of the things you personally learned from doing AI that maybe other people could learn from and maybe apply at their association? So I would say there's a few a few things that I use it for just on a regular basis that I think would absolutely apply to association that I do want to caveat it because I do think you bring up an important point that you do have to be careful with these things, right? So um, you want to have some you know policies and um, best practices in place within your association if you are going to encourage this experimentation. And one thing um, that we were actually talking about before we started um, recording the podcast is just as a best practice. First of all, I never put sensitive information into ChatGPT. It's just not a good idea. You should never do that. Um, but even when I'm putting in information that might have just like some, you know, things that I that I just feel like it's not sensitive, it's not confidential, but I'd rather just redact this. I generally redact a lot of information ahead of time before I even put it into ChatGPT. So I want to say that is kind of like a good general best practice. Um, we're fortunate enough that we've also adopted Microsoft Copilot, which kind of gives you that added level of assurance because it's in your Microsoft tenant, right? Rather than going to ChatGPT. Um, so that's that's, a, that's kind of a different layer too. Um, but I think there's just a lot of a kind of low-hanging fruit. It's really easy. It doesn't involve um, sensitive information that you can that you can use it for just kind of right out of the gate. Um, for me, I use it a lot of times for just ideation. So um, we're coming up with a new uh, product concept, and I want some ideas on the name of the product, or even if we're hosting an event, which would be more applicable to associations. Uh, what do we want to call that event? What are some ideas for session tracks and topics? Um, that's all things that you could easily use ChatGPT to kind of help get you started. So I use it almost, I think of it as kind of a colleague, um, you know, maybe kind of a, a colleague with not quite as much experience. So I'm going to have to feed it kind of more information in the context and the direction I'm thinking about and going in. Um, but, but I treat it kind of as a colleague and going back and forth or what do you think about this? How about this? Uh, what if we tweaked this just slightly? Because I don't really think that that, let's say that title of that session really speaks to Gen Z or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I use it a lot for ideation. Um, one area that I just think is so ripe for associations in particular that I use it for is content repurposing. So if you have existing bodies of content, publicly available content, so often it could be like educational content marketing content, um, I'll use, I'll actually feed it that content and then ask it to repurpose it in a different format. So let's say for example, um, you're an association and you're sitting on some old um, you know, articles or white papers, but you think, mm, well, really in this day and age, a lot of people are really interacting more with short form video. I would love to translate this piece of content into a video script that we could then create a short form video from. Um, so you have to kind of think through, okay, well, what's that format of the video, right? Like about how long do you want that video? Um, you know, how many frames maybe do you want to include in that video? Um, you know, some of these things, um, how you want to give a direction on how you want to kind of con con uh, condense the messaging, or if you want it to focus on certain areas of that, that article or white paper. Um, but that's a great way to, to use AI, I think, is just if you have, you're, as an association, you're sitting on so much valuable content. And if you think about the corpus of content that associations are, are sitting on and how far back it goes, I mean, there's just a treasure trove of information that you can go back to and find ways to repurpose it, modernize it, and make it more accessible to your members. You know, and I, I think that's an excellent point, Johanna, because you're right. So many associations have libraries of things, of articles or interviews or sessions from past annual meeting conferences. And it's all just sitting there not being used. And that's because nobody knows how to find it. Nobody has the time to dig through all those dusty old boxes in the storeroom. 
and, and find these things. So I think that's an excellent tip for associations to use AI for is find all this stuff and catalog it and find out, does it need to be updated? I, that's a question you can ask chat GPT as well is update this information. I am a huge fan of Google Bard because it's the large language model and I like that. I just use it to give me some quick research and then I go out and double check it and, and I can integrate that into the work. I always give it a citation. <laughs> I don't claim it's my own work. Uh, and I think that's another thing. I, you know, it's an interesting point what you said about not putting sensitive information in chat GPT. So not everyone quite understands how chat GPT works. So could you give us a quick overview of how you would use it? Yeah, so, um, in, well, so there's a few steps that I usually take uh, when I'm using chat GPT. And um, a lot of this actually I learned from an AI bootcamp that Thomas Altman and Dre McFarlane ran and that we've had all of our internal staff go through um, at Blue Cypress. Um, but they really explain that these large language models are really next word predictors. And so even if you're putting in a bunch of text and prompts, really they're looking at each of those individual words and the algorithm kind of at its simplest form is looking at what's the, what's the most likely next word. And if you think about it that way, then you can kind of understand the way that uh, these large language models operate. And you can think more about what's the best way to prompt it. Um, so for me, um, I like to do, I probably most often do uh, kind of chain of thought responses, or I'll also like just kind of stagger the information that are that I'm putting into the model. Um, so I'll give it some back, I won't ask it to actually execute on something um, until I've kind of given it all the background information, confirmed and had it recite back to me exactly what I said, mm -hmm. and then I'll ask it to actually execute on an activity. So um, to give you an example, um, let's say I'm working on a go-to-market uh, for a product within within our uh, within our company, and I want to think through um, some different sections of that go-to-market. And you know, I already have a bunch of raw notes and information that I'm thinking about um, in terms of how I want to incorporate that. Um, I won't just go in there and say, "Give me a full <laughs> go-to-market." I'll I'll talk through it kind of step by step, and I'll go through kind of each section. Um, that I want to that I want to get kind of some raw content for or approach to, um, and I'll have it spit that information back to me. And um, and as I'm prompting it and grounding it with that context, um, I actually learned this on a on a different YouTube video. But I'll ask, do you understand um, on these different prompts, and have it kind of confirm that back to me? And it just results in a lot better um, output from the LLM if you kind of go through that step by step process. And the other thing you can do. Um, that's kind of an example of me going kind of step by step in terms of asking it to perform certain tasks. But you can also go back and ask the AI how it how it actually arrived at the information or the, you know, the summary or the, you know, whatever it is that it's it's outputting. But um, you can ask it how it arrived at that and ask it to break down the steps that it went through and why it provided that response, which which can also help with that transparency um, and kind of give you a little bit. I mean, AI is such a black box to a large extent and how it works, but it can give you just a little bit more information on how it's arriving at that conclusion and also help you with future prompting if you're still refining what you're trying to get out of it. Interesting. So I hear a lot of people say they talk to chat GPT. So do you actually talk to it through your microphone or when you're talking to it, are you typing? So actually, it's really funny to say that. I do use it on my desktop um, and, and type into it a lot, um, but I actually find it's more efficient for me to use ChatGPT from my phone. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times I always take a walk, you know, during the day just to kind of get out of the house. Like, like a lot of people, I work from home. And if I don't do that, I, I end up on my third floor, you know, all day. But what I'll do sometimes, which which is actually extremely powerful, if you think about the way AI works, is you don't need to give it perfectly crafted, you know, grammatically correct um, prompts um, because the AI is really just looking at like word by word and then piecing together based on all of its knowledge, like what it is you're trying to say. So because I don't have to give it these kind of perfect, perfect prompts in, the, in, in that they're perfectly formatted and, um, you know, well-constructed and, and all of that, I'll actually do stream of consciousness just into the chat GPT app. So I'll go for a walk and say, hey, 
I'm thinking about, you know, pulling together a summary of X, Y, Z. I really want to, you know, I really want to emphasize these three points in, in this summary. Um, here's some additional context for why we're communicating this, you know, this piece of knowledge or information. This is who I think, this is who my audience is. And I'll just talk to it like that. And it will literally just be a stream of consciousness. But it's so easy then, it saves me even more time. And then you just submit that to ChatGPT. And it's just way more efficient for me than, you know. Oh, no. You know, trying to give it something that's already like perfectly crafted and ready to go. And if anyone heard me say, oh, no, I thought our signal froze for a second. So. Oh, did I freeze? Yeah, I, yeah, just for like a blip. And I was like, oh no, but no, it's fine. <laughs> we might just leave that in. It makes it a little more realistic. <laughs> no, but I love that stream of consciousness because really that, that's how we think as humans. And so we're modeling these tools after how we think and what we're trying to accomplish. So it actually makes a lot of sense to use stream of consciousness when you're talking to whatever AI tool you might be using. So I, you know, you had also mentioned as we were talking about this episode, how AI could operationalize or help operationalize some things within the associations. And I know this seems like kind of a big swing away from stream of consciousness, but you know, that that's really kind of for research or I'm putting together a proposal or something, but using AI to help actually keep the train's running on time as the saying goes, you know, let's, let's stay on schedule. Uh, because my, my favorite character in a novel is Dagny Taggart, who is the heroine of Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, because she runs a train, a railroad, basically. And part of her job is keeping things on schedule. And she's really in charge of operations, which I think people kind of look down on operations from time to time. Uh, they think it's not interesting or strategic. And it, that's actually not true. It's very interesting and very strategic. So AI could actually be a very strategic approach to operations. And, you know, I'll make, I'll make the statement. I think stream of consciousness and operations does come into play from time to time. But what are, what are some suggestions you might have about using AI to help run operations more smoothly in an organization? It sounds like you probably do that at Blue Cypress too. Yeah, well, I actually think it's really great for writing things like SOPs. I think it's amazing for that. So I think that's a great use case. Um, another thing that I'll do is like, probably like a lot of people, you might be sitting on um, a body of content, you know, that either you've created or people within your team have created. That's kind of more the output, but you're, you've, and maybe you've always thought, oh, it'd be great to templatize this one thing. Like we have all these different kind of versions of it, but what if we could just create like a template from scratch, but it's one of those things that's kind of like, oh, that would be nice to get to, you know, at some point down the road. Um, but it's, it's something that kind of is always like at the bottom of your to-do list. Right. So I, I think it could also be really, really great for that. Um, and that's something too, where I've noticed copilot, our adoption of copilot has been great because I can literally just point copilot to a few files, right. That I have in my OneDrive and say, Hey, you know, this is, this is an example of a report, you know, that we've generated over and over again, or, um, you know, just any kind of like memo or you know, anything that's sort of like that you want to get templatized in some way and just say, hey, can you actually draft a template and a process around this? And that's something that I think AI would really accelerate at. And that, that is definitely a time saver. I know somebody who said they uh, programmed it to write in the voice of a volunteer leader. And that really saves them a lot of time because there's not as much editing going back and forth. So you can train it to do those kind of tools. And you had also mentioned AI as an executive assistant. And I said, ooh, cool, because that kind of supports the operations topic, kind of a subtopic. So what are some things an association might be able to use AI as an executive assistant to do? So I've used, right. So I've used it for internal communications a lot. Um, you know, I'm actually a pretty uh, dry writer, naturally. Like my copy, like, isn't super... Uh, like marketing forward or engaging. So um, in the past, when I've wanted to write internal communications or like celebrate, you know, certain wins or great things going on with the, within the organization, whenever I draft it, 
it falls kind of flat. And then I have to do a lot of editing to make it a little bit more engaging and exciting for people. Um, so I don't really have to worry about fussing around with that anymore because now I just drop it into AI and I give it some direction on kind of tone of voice. Um, you know, maybe I even want to include some emojis, just like make it easier for people to quickly process it and read it. Um, so it's really great for for time save time savers for things like that for internal communications. Also, if like maybe something that I wrote is I think it's great, but it's just like it's really long. I'm like no one's going to read this when it comes into their inbox. Um, can we make it a little bit shorter and just you know capture the key points? So it's it's great with stuff like that. Um, I'll actually also use it, um, which is which is kind of I'd be curious to see if there are other people out there that are doing this as well, but. Um, I'll do it for, we, we have a fractional general counsel that works at Blue Cypress, he's part-time, um, but a lot of times to save time, if there's, let's say um, I'm reviewing a contract and I know that uh, there's a business reason that I wanna modify a certain clause, but normally I would just go back to our general counsel and I would say, I don't want to you know, allow for this. I want to you know, rewrite this clause, you know, basically saying X, Y, Z. I can actually use AI to do that first draft and it saves me time with my with my general counsel. And it's actually really good at the first drafts. I mean, usually um, when I do send him those, he comes back, he's like, this is this is pretty good. You know, you might do a tweak here, tweak there. Um, but it's actually really good um, with doing those initial drafts. And obviously like nothing sensitive, it would all be, you know, just like regular contract, standard contract clauses that wouldn't be sensitive um, in terms of using the AI for it. But it's been a time saver and a, and a money saver for us in terms of being able to do that. Wow, that's amazing. And then you don't have to hire as many staff, obviously. So that makes the staff you have more focused and more effective. And for the people in the audience who wonder why she keeps saying effective instead of efficient, it's because I minored in management in college. And that was one of the things I learned that really stuck with me. Efficient means you just get it done quickly in a timely manner with as few moves as possible. But effective means that has a lot of impact. And so AI is effective in delivering that impact. So that's how we can use AI to help associations be more effective in supporting their mission and pursuing that. So earlier, Johanna, you had mentioned policies, having internal policies about AI. And that's really important. And a lot of people are talking about that more and more. And people are writing use policies and citation policies and when you can use it, when you can't internally. But are there other concerns for associations or really any organization when it comes to integrating AI into their organization and using it on a regular basis? Are there any other things we should be aware of? Well, the policies are really important. And I think doing some education around what is sensitive information and what isn't, because I think a lot of people throw around, you know, oh, we need a policy document, but does everyone in your organization even know what kind of falls into these different categories or classes of information? You know, a lot of people probably don't. So just doing some education on that, I think first and foremost um, is really important. Um, but then beyond that, I would say um, coming up with some ways that you can have sort of a, a safe and easy way for people to experiment, whether it's developing some internal use cases that just make sense, right? And that are also just good examples. Like I always kind of go back to um, sort of like generic communications, marketing communications, because it's all external public information anyway. I mean, those are some really easy ways uh, to start with AI. Um, so, it, and if you have some of those examples, I think it also helps people know where to get started. Uh, and then the other piece I think is just giving them access to, to education and having a forum internally where people can talk about that, you know, whether it's you know, let's say you're using, you know, Microsoft Teams or Slack, maybe it's having a channel there where people can share information and, and use cases, um, you know, or whatever, whatever it is in your organization. But I think having an open dialogue and putting some structure around it too, like, um, it's something that I've seen that's been really effective at some of the associations we've worked with that have implemented AI is that they will do these kind of like breakout teams within functional areas um, where they'll get together within that functional area to talk about you know, does AI make sense in our in the area that we operate, and what are some you know safe, good use cases, and then coming together then as a as a broader organization across the association to then share that through a spokesperson um, from each of the different areas. I think that's a really really effective way to um, to kind of get it contextualized more for you know your specific role, but then also share that information across the entire organization. Yeah, and I. I actually think that the nonprofit worlds 
and specifically association approach to doing things slowly is probably a good one here because people I think kind of are jumping into AI. Oh, just let the AI do a and kind of abdicating responsibility. So that's a very thoughtful approach. I really like that because people are getting together. How can we use it? What what is it going to be for? And then share that with everyone else. And I think that's a great way to handle it. And you're in a big complex organization. So that's probably really important to do that. So as we're, uh, I know we could go on and on about AI and all the different things, but I did want to talk with you before we wrap up this episode. I wanted to talk with you about what do you see as the future for associations because they're successfully incorporating artificial intelligence tools? So for associations, um, and actually, so I was a co-author on Ascend, which is a, a book that we wrote um, on AI for associations, written by Amith, and a few of us were co-authors on it. But there's we talk about this moat that associations have in terms of their assets. Um, and really, it, it comes down to kind of three areas. One is their brand reputation, which is something no other organization right um, outside of the association space is probably going to be able to compete effectively with that sort of brand recognition that they that you know and knowledge and and respect that the associations built up over the years. And then there's also um, you know the content that they're sitting on um, is the third kind of asset and moat that they have in terms of um, what they provide to their members. So it's so it's the brand, it's the content. Um, and then, and then the final thing is the network and the members. So it's thinking about, okay, if those are the three like, kind of key assets that really differentiate us as an association from any other, you know, body, you know, within the space, whether, you know, it's a for-profit organization or whatever it is, if those are kind of our key assets and our moat that, that protects us and, ma and makes us you know, really valuable in this space, how can we use AI to to enhance that, right? And so um, I think looking at content is incredibly important. Um, but then I would say there's this important kind of prerequisite that we actually didn't get a, a chance to touch on today um, that's related to data that I think is really important. Oh, yeah. And that is, yeah, it, it just, so as an association, you can't really, you can't really start to leverage AI internally and effectively if you haven't really gotten control of your data and gotten it into one central place and, and also gotten your data into a place where it's um it's 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 like accessible and and it's and it's clean. So exactly. I would really encourage associations to implement, which is something we've actually implemented at Blue Cypress, is um a CDP um, or a customer data platform where you're basically piping in data from all of your different systems into one central location. I mean a lot of associations do this with more of a, a like a, a data lake approach. Um, CDP is a little bit of a different approach in that um, you can just do a little bit more with the data in a CDP. Um, and there's more resources that I'm happy to provide kind of as a follow-up to that. But I think getting your data in a good place is just su such a fundamental prerequisite because um, you know there's little things that you can do just as an individual person, right, in terms of your your you know your operational output within the association. But that's not going to really move the needle in terms of the association and what you deliver to your members, you know, in a strategic way. So um, you've got to have your data sort of in one central location to be able to layer AI on top of it and really get those insights that are going to propel the association forward, that are going to enable you to become more personalized in your interactions with your members, that are going to allow you to uncover trends that you wouldn't necessarily be able to uncover before, um, just because, you know, the rapid change in AI and the pace with with which we'll be able to do um, data analytics um, and analysis moving forward. So I would say if there's if there's one thing, kind of my parting thought would be if there's one thing associations should be doing now, it should be looking at their data, getting it into one central location um, where it's not you know just individually tied up in all these disparate systems, so that you have this kind of good foundation and groundwork to then layer in you know AI initiatives related to personalization. Um, related to data analytics um, that will better equip you, right, to take advantage of AI and, and the opportunities that you're going to have moving forward. Well, and I think, first of all, thank you for reminding me we didn't touch on data, which we should have, because I'm a data freak. You'd think I'd remember that. <laughs> but I was thinking there's so much that goes into AI and what you can do with it. But I 
I think that's an excellent point though, toward building that future. Because if you don't have that data accessible and cleaned up, then the AI is not going to be as helpful. And, and so to get to the future, you have to really focus on getting all of that organized. And yeah, you know, I had not thought of it that way when you said you have a CDP instead of a, the data lake approach. The first thing I thought when you said that was like, huh, if something's in a lake, you can't really find it because you really got to dig around, right? It might've sunk to the bottom or it could be floating on the other side, on the other shore of the lake or something. And it's all just kind of dumped in there, not in an organized way, right? It's just all yeah. dumped and it's not set up. And I think a lot of uh, associations, actually, let's just be honest, any organization, it doesn't have to be an association or any kind of nonprofit. A lot of for-profits probably do it too. You put the data over here in one system, and then you move to a different system, and you either don't have a process in place to move that data, migrate it over, or you just kind of forget it's there, or you're trying to run both systems at the same time. And I've, I've had that challenge trying to register for conferences at organizations I'm a member of, because your membership data is in one system, and the registration for conference data is in a different system, and you need different passwords, and it gets to be really kind of a pain. And then the data is not updated. Uh, you know, quick example of that is you would think a big national company would take better care of their data, but my cable company does not. And I spent an hour on the phone telling them a couple of years ago, well, I have been a customer for over 20 years and you're treating me like I've only been a customer for seven. I said, but I've had all these different addresses and I've kept your cable service the entire time and moved it with me, but you don't have an integrated data system. Right. And so I basically gave them like an hour, hour and a half of free consulting on how to manage their data and move it with people and keep it updated because they were doing the same thing, moving it into different systems, not integrating it. Whereas to your excellent point, if you have it all in one place, you can really personalize, you can really get more analytics, but how does that person engage with this organization? Again, whether it's a for-profit or a nonprofit, how is that individual engaging? How are they using the organization? Are they seeming to get what they need or have they not done anything with us for three years? What's going on there? What can we learn? So that's really important. And can you quickly again, explain what a CDP is? Because I think that's an important point for people to know. Sure. So, um, and I actually think I said customer data platform before. It's common data platform. Uh, I was getting my wires crossed with CRM, but um, right. but uh, it's basically um, an area where you're piping in uh, multiple applications. Um, so, for an association, it'd be like your LMS, your FMS, um, your AMS, um, all piping it into one central location, um, and and then you can tie those records together, obviously, with you know a you know a common identifier. Um, one one big benefit um, to, to one of your earlier points that we did with our common data platform is that um, as soon as we pipe that data in and we had it one place, we could actually layer in some AI immediately to standardize the data. So, um, you know, a lot of this data maybe is, is sort of unstructured in terms of being able to report on it. So, so I'll give you an example. Um, associations are probably sitting on a lot of data where um, they have the titles of their members, right? But title is, is something that's not a standardized data point. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and, and also trying to figure out, you know, what um, functional area or department that they represent. That's not something that is probably standardized in your AMS right now. What we were able to do with our data and, and our CDP is we pumped all the data in there from these disparate systems. And then we actually layered in AI on top of that. We, we decided that, you know, this was going to be kind of our tagging system for um, both rank. So uh, when we use the term rank in our CDP, basically denotes like title level. So it would be, you know, basically manager, director, VP, CXO, um, and then, and then, and gen, you know, general staff, I think are the buckets that we have. And then um, functional area, you know, education, meetings and events, membership. Um, but what we were able to do is actually layer in AI and, and give it, you know, some direction on, okay, these are kind of the keywords and whatever that you should look for. And um, if these exist, then you should, you know, basically, and I'm probably butchering it because it was a bunch of developers within our company that did it. <laughs> but um, basically just look at all the data and then um, it translated it using AI into what the most likely uh, rank and department was based on that. And now we can actually run really meaningful reports 
um, on people's, you know, functions and roles um, within, you know, organizations. So that's something that I think if associations get their data in one place, that would be incredibly impactful for benchmarking reports for their industries that they serve. I mean, that could be a I mean, that could be an immediate revenue stream, right, for the association if they're really able to streamline and uh, more quickly uh, de develop, you know, if they're already offering benchmark reports, more quickly develop them or just have that as a whole new offering to their industry that they can sell. So I, I think there's just like immense possibilities if you can get the data in one place uh, to then actually use AI to, to clean it up and to standardize it. Wow. And so not to belabor the point, but I just think that is fascinating. Wow. A system where everything's just there. So is it the Wicket style system that you're using or did you have your own design? So we actually, we use Member Junction, which is also one of the companies within Blue Cypress. Um, Member Junction is a little bit unique in that the product itself is open source. So it's actually a free product. Anyone could go download it on the Member Junction website. Um, there's no cost associated with it. Like all the code, everything is, is readily available. We did it, um, we released it that way because um, we just feel very strongly in terms of um, protecting you know, privacy and um, just data ownership. And we thought that that was something that was really important for associations as well. So that's why we decided to go the, um, the open source route. Um, Member Junction does also, they also do, you know, consulting and services work if you need help implementing it. But, um, but yeah, we use that open source product because we wanted to be able to truly own uh, the data. We didn't want, we didn't want to pick just a SaaS product where, where our data would be living kind of tied up in just like another, you know, proprietary system that, you know, belongs to another vendor. So we wanted it on our servers and control of it. Um, so that's the, that's the route we went. Yeah, well, that that's great. And that makes a lot of sense. And that sounds like a, a great tool that associations can investigate for doing that. Because I think one of the obstacles to better data management and cleaner data, and, and I was always that membership director of the department saying, we have so much data and we're not doing anything with it, or it's not clean enough. It's not consistent. We have file jars full of paper and it's not in the system. So being able to take all of that and put it in one place fairly easily would just really be a boon, I think, to any organization, but especially a membership association, because members do so much over the years and it, and it gets kind of lost. You know, it's like we all have that little junk drawer in our house where we just kind of throw <laughs> stuff we don't have to do with it. And then you yep. kind of have that kind of data about a person. Well, they kind of did this article 20 years ago, but. You know, we just kind of threw that in the junk drawer of data over here because we had it was one thing. We just put it there and we go through the drawer every once in a while, but we're not quite sure what's in it. So, exactly. <laughs> so that's a great analogy. <laughs> so I yeah, I think wow, this sounds really great. I I'll be honest, you know, I like technology. I use it a lot. Uh, I'm my own IT department, but I had not heard the term a uh, community data platform before. So that's that's really cool to learn about that. So uh Thank you so much for coming on uh, Radio Free 501C and sharing all this good information. My gosh, you know, there's a lot going on out there. And it's another argument for associations to set aside the time to do these things. Everybody says, I don't have time for that. But yet we always have time to clean up the mess that gets made because we don't do the lead work on things. So Thank you for all this. This has been awesome. I've really enjoyed it. A really different perspective on AI and your personal journey of AI is really interesting too. So I want to thank you for sharing that. And before we wrap up, I always like to ask my guests, what's the one thought you would like the audience to take away today? And how can they get in touch with you if they want to follow up? Um, so my one, th well, the, C the CDP actually was one thing that I did want to, I did want to leave with, but the other thing I would say is, um, if you are thinking about experimenting with AI and you're just not sure how to get started, I do have like a couple of suggestions of kind of use cases, um, that might be easy, low hanging fruit that you could think of. And it could even be something related to your personal life. Um, so, you know, one example is what we talked about earlier. Think about, think about something that you've created numerous times that you could feed into AI and just create a template from that would save you time moving forward. That would be like a very easy something to just pick off and, and get benefit from. Um, another piece would be the content repurposing, which I think is especially applicable to associations. That would be something that would be really easy to, to try out, especially if you work 
in education or if you work within marketing and associations, you know, that's just a really kind of exciting um, thing that you could do to, to try it out and, to, and, and, and a very kind of easy, low risk, you know, type of thing as well. Um, and then um, the final thing that I think, which you could also probably use like a personal life example for, which I have an example of, is um, think about something that maybe you would want to start from scratch, but you know that you want it to follow either a certain template or, or a certain writing style or a certain format. Um, and you have you have access to an example that you could provide. So one example, I've, this is a personal use that I use for it, is that I have two young kids at home and uh, I had read that, you know, the ages of my kids are three and five, that kids at that age really struggle with transitions. And I read an article that said, you know, it's really helpful if you can actually write yourself a personalized story for your child talking about that transition, but using them kind of as the key, you know, person in the story so that they identify with what's going on and talk about that specific transition that they're going through. So maybe it's starting a new school or something like that. So, um, but I thought that's, that's great, but I work full time. And when am I ever going to sit down and write a children's book? And I don't even know how to structure that. But this article actually had two examples of these books. So I threw them into chat GPT. And then I said, okay. And Obviously, I didn't share my my children's names or anything, but I said, and my example was actually that they were starting a new school. And I said, here's some examples of this format of stories. I want to make my kids, you know, the main character in these story in this story. And I want it to be about transitioning to a new school and explain to them what that means. And it, you know, within a few seconds, I had a story. Um, I was able to do some quick image generation too through Dolly. And then I had a very personalized story that I was able to read with my kids to help with that transition. So those are just some examples that I think people could get people started. I love that about the kids story. That's that's really a great tip. It was really powerful. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. Well, and those are all really great ideas for, you know, tr- you know, testing it out too. Some people are cautious. Uh, I don't so much a cautious person as a, well, a kind of a, I don't know about this, one of those things that can kind of go off the rails if we're not careful. So, but those sound like really great ways to get familiar with AI and AI tools and how it can help us uh, in our daily work in life. That's wonderful. So, well, uh, Johanna, how can people get in touch if they wanted to follow up with you? So um, you can definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn, um, Johanna Casper uh, Snyder, Casper with a K. Um, Snyder with an I, I'll <laughs> buy both of those. Um, you can also re- reach, is it okay to share email over this? Uh, oh yes, of course. Yeah. Email's okay. great. Okay. Um, so johanna.snyder at bluecypress.io is another way to reach me. Great. Well, thank you so much. Well, this has been a great conversation on AI and associations full with lots of great advice for us all to look to. So I want to again, thank my guest, Johanna Snyder, who's CEO of Blue Cypress for coming on and sharing all of these great insights and ideas. But we have to go rogue for now. We'll be back next time with another exciting episode. So please don't forget to subscribe because you don't want to miss a thing. If you'd like to learn more about Rogue Tulips Consulting and how we can help your company or organization bloom outside the box, check out our website, roguetulips.com, and you can see a list of our services. If you don't see what you're looking for, let's have a conversation because we can probably still work together. We also have all of our fees on our website because we believe in transparency. Now, if you're a curious sort like Johanna and myself, and you want to get some education, maybe to renew your CAE or you're getting ready for the CAE exam, we also have an education program, Rogue Tulips Education, formerly the 501C League. It's a program so big, it has to have its own website, the 501Cleague.net. You can look at our courses for the strength session, which are geared toward the May exam. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And on behalf of Johanna and myself, we'll see you next time.